Welcome back, everybody. So our next speaker is Kaylee Lane. <laughs> Kaylee has a background in working at a variety of NGOs before coming here. And since getting to, to Scripps, she's tried to try everything that crosses her path at least once, including eating a tuna eyeball with Ross, <laughs> grunion hunting, lobster diving, volunteering in a lab, taking R, giving testimony, and taking the scientific diving class. You took the boating class too, right? And the boating class. Um, we're really excited to have Kaylee to be a part of this cohort. She's been an integral uh, component of, of making this cohort what it is today. And the title of her presentation is A Silver Bullet for a Silver Fish, Chasing Answers Behind Surf Smelt Decline with the Talawa Daini Nation. Hi. So as Samantha said, I had the distinct pleasure of working with the Talawa Daini Nation on my capstone. I worked alongside their Marine Program Manager, Rosa Lauchi, and their Tribal Resource Specialist, J. Tuck Steinruck. And I thought, before I got into why I did my capstone, I thought J. Tuck might be able to explain it to you in his own words. There would be hundreds of campfires up and down this beach, and they were all families camping on the beach to dry snow. And normally, you can sit down here and see cormorants fly by, and then they'll start diving. And normally, there's like harbor seals and sea lions at times that'll roam the surf. When I was down here this year, I didn't even see one seal looking for smell. So. We look at those natural indicators to tell us when the smelt are here. The last time we caught enough fish to dry on this beach was four years ago, 2014. So, surf smelt, known to the Talua as kinch, um, are a beautiful silver little fish. And you can see here a female on the bottom and a male in its beautiful golden spawning hue up top. A member of the Osmerid family, their Latin name is Hypomesis Prediosis. Prediosis denoting how precious and valuable they are, relating to their tender and delicate meat, which I have been lucky enough to try. One of their names is Surf Smelt, talking about how they spawn and school in the breakers, literally in the breaking surf before they spawn on the beach. Silver Smelt, and finally Dayfish, referring to how they spawn during the day. So they are a forage fish, and this spawning and schooling behavior is very characteristic of these fish. They provide a very important role, almost essential in transferring energy up from their planktonic prey, up to predators uh, in ranging from whales, seabirds, sea lions, and a whole uh, host of other variety of predators. So the one thing that sets them apart from a lot of these larger fish, uh, larger schooling fish like sardines and anchoveta that have recently gathered a lot of scientific attention is that they spawn on the beach. They coin the term sex on the beach, truly. <laughs> At certain times of year, after cer certain falling high tides with certain environmental cues, surf smelt gather near beaches and they run in one mass upwards onto shore. Some environmental cue drives them to abandon the safety of the water and create the next generation on our beaches. They literally risk their lives to run the gauntlet of both marine and terrestrial predators, exposing themselves and their offspring to almost anything. And then their very tiny embryos settle into a very specific type of gravel that they seek out that we call pea-sized gravel, about one to seven millimeters in diameter, where it sticks to the gravel and then incubates on land in a matter of weeks. This is no small, small feat on the northern coast of California, where wave heights average nine feet. One fisherman told me that they literally wait for the wave to boil until it becomes a struggling, writhing, wriggling mass of surf smelt, struggling against each other before it crests and falls and collapses back into the water. So it goes without saying that these eggs stand to be reasonably hardy, exposed to water and air and the various elements. Experts surmise that because the beaches of Northern California were never exposed to glaciers, 
Northern California's surf smelt spawning sites might conceivably have been quasi-stable for millions, if not thousands of years. It's possible that they're even their own species. And the Talua Daini like to say that they've been harvesting these smelts since time immemorial. Presently, the Talua Daini are the only tribe still practicing fish camp. That makes it all the more frightening then, when 90% of Talua Daini members cited surf smelt numbers as being worse or significantly worse than when they were children in 2016. This is unfortunate though, because surf smelt is what we would characterize as a data poor fishery. PFMC said it was of minor significance that same year that the tribal harvest saw that it was threatened in 2011. NOAA described it as having inadequate life history. And then finally, the Monterey Bay Aquarium cited it as vulnerable only because of its lack of formal stock assessments. So what's a fish to do? The Talua will not sit back on their heels just because the state doesn't know anything about these fish. They went after their own data. So my capstone centered around three different things. I stepped in to assess TDN's collected data in what is currently the only surf smelt habitat assessment happening in California. I centered around the following three topics. I studied and pulled data from their traditional ecological knowledge database. I visualized their self-collected GIS habitat assessment data. And then finally, I spent hours poring over commercial landings data collected from California Fish and Wildlife. The first part of my data centered around traditional ecological knowledge. Tribal citizens who continue the traditional management of their fisheries have an intimate understanding of coastal ecosystems built from millennia of practice. It's no coincidence that while only 2% of lands fall under tribal management, 80% of the world's biodiversity falls on these lands. Traditional knowledge is increasingly recognized as a unique expertise and its ability to inform con conservation ma management and policy resources. The TDN are no stranger for standing up for their right to harvest, having taken a vocal role in the Marine Life Protection Act initiative um, and gaining the right to harvest within MPAs. The main offshoot of this project was a traditional ecological native database with geospatially linked archival data and interviews stretching back to 1850. I was able to pull this data to visualize documented surf smelt locations here. Because tribes are such place-based people, having that generations of knowledge in that place can give you a much richer understanding of what is going on. Most fishery studies are looking at today and how that will change tomorrow. But is today really that abundant and healthy? How can we know if our baselines have shifted? The next part of my research focused on establishing that baseline data, which Rosa and JTUC collected very well on their own. This slide is really just to give a nod to the amount of work they did. I only looked at one of the two beaches that they looked at. These two people spent five years characterizing a beach that was 40,000 feet in length, 14,000 square feet of total gravel visualized, 450 individual gravel beds, and again, they were characterizing that one to seven millimeter, very specific pea-sized gravel that that so surf smelt need. And again, it was over five years. And I found, based on the few research studies that are out there, a lot of them out of Puget Sound, which again, might be a completely different subspecies, that there was suitable gravel presence over the five years. The bed temperatures within were within the safe range for egg mortality. Um, and then finally, there was suitable beach slope to allow the surf smelt to spawn on the beach. In addition, I tried to address some of the concerns the tribe had. In this animation, um, I'm sort of trying to show how I went to UCSB's aerial photo archive and I tried to show the built structure change between 1948 and 2017. I found a tenfold increase in built structures within the study area just within two kilometers. In addition, the tribe was very worried about the erosion happening on their beaches. Almost a meter per year was being lost. While they seem high, they're both within the average range for the state of California, both in population growth and erosion. So based on the amount of environmental variability um, and its role in surf and forage fish populations, I assume that it might be something bigger happening in the oceanic environment. And that's when I turned to our landing data. Again, this is a state-managed fishery. This is all California data. 
the recreational fishery is said to possibly be equal to commercial landings, but we have no reporting measures in place to understand how many fish are being taken. I quickly realized that the commercial landings data was flawed. In 1989, surf smelt were finally grouped as a species. I looked in Eureka in particular because this is where 97% of the statewide commercial harvest happens. Finally, in 2000, California State Parks instituted a permit system. Many of the fishermen harvest on California State Park beaches, and they instituted a permit system trying to phase out these fishermen because of snowy plover regulations. These nuances have made it almost impossible to cross-correlate climate indices with this landing data. And then someone told me about the smelt king. I reached out to Gene Logan when I realized the CDFW landings data fell flat. Gene Logan lives and fishes in Oric, like his father and his grandfather before him, a small town an hour south of Smith River, which is a relatively short difference considering how unpopulated this area is. Called the Smelt King by people who know him, he is one of only eight fishermen still allowed to drive his truck on Gold Bluff Beach, where those snowy plover regulations have happened. While Gene is vocally mistrustful of biologists, scientists, and people like me because of this permit process, he admitted to me that he has seen a decline and wants to share his knowledge with us, but strongly declined, denies that any overfishing has occurred. And the thing is, we don't have the data to say that it has or hasn't. My conversations with Gene left me wondering, are we shutting out the very people who give us the landings data? We're phasing them out, and yet we know so very little about why surf smelt use the phases, place, beaches they do. We might be shedding fishermen out when we could be collaborating with them and trying to understand where these fish are or aren't showing up. Gene Logan raised his boys while making a living off of the fish that come out of the rich waters of the north coast of California, and he has every reason to ensure that it continues to happen. Gene's son, Adam, is seen here holding one of his father's carbon fiber nets. Adam feels lucky that he grew up learning to fish from his father, but it's very unlikely that he'll continue to do so because of these permits. Understandably, the Taladini also have an impetus to make sure these fish remain for the next generation. An impetus somewhere in the ballpark of time immemorial. I'd like to end with the voice of tribal elder and JTUC's mother, Cheryl, and her concerns. And this is a video. We worry about how are we going to teach our young ones if there's no fish to catch, if there's no mussels, no clams. How can you acquire a taste for something that doesn't exist? Understandably, understandably, there is no silver bullet to solve surf smelt decline. The most valuable thing we can do is to continue to empower small communities and tribes to build the capacity to manage their own ecosystems. And with that, I hope you'll join me in spreading the word about these very important fish and the people who care about them, including the next generation of North Coast Hinch stewards. And with that, I'd like to say shanila to a wide variety of people, including my capstone committee, Heidi Batchelor, Rosa, J. Tuck, Leah Mellinger, Amy Work, <laughs> uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Samantha, Risa, and my entire class, as well as Art Miller um, and Elena. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Crystal. This is just a comment. I wanted to say thank you for giving a voice to these local communities because they do often get shut out and they're such an important part that can help inform the scientific process. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I felt very lucky to do it. Can you tell me a little bit about how it was uh, those conversations with the Smelt King went? Because <laughs> you know, they sound crazy. <laughs> Thank you, Raynon. Yes, um, Jean is not crazy at all. Um, he is just a font of wisdom and also entertainment. He, the thing I say spread the word about clunch or surf smelt, but it's really spreading the gospel. Um, it's a fish that we never see in stores, but it's a delicious fish that the people who catch it, tribal or commercial or recreational alike, Love. I mean, I think it's really something that we're missing out. They'd really like to build the capacity uh, for people to eat this fish, and we currently don't. But I think it took a lot of trust building, just like um, working with any commercial fishermen, uh, especially up there. Um, I was also lucky that the tribe itself uh, collaborates 
with scripts itself very often, and there was no need to trust build there. They're really on top of it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, art? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I'm not a biologist, so I'll ask a question about biology. Um, there's a lot of species where they analyze stomach contents of the stuff mm -hmm. that they're eating, and they partition it into different species. Is are, are is there any evidence of like indirect, you know, ca um, computation of how much smelt there was out there from stomach contents of different critters that live in the area? Yeah, thank you. That was actually um, one of the studies I really drew from and what prompted me to try to get into the climate indices, which I'm still working on. Uh, there was a study with common MERS off the coast of Newport, Oregon. Um, and in negative PDO years, they found a high content of surf smelt in their stomachs and sand lance, as opposed to other years when they were more clupeids. Uh, they think, obviously, like there's foraging variability in the birds in terms of if they would go to something more near shore in these, in these years. Uh, but that hypothesis that negative PDOs might relate to the surf smelt is something I'm still looking at, as you know. <laughs> Thank you.